Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public and welcome to Contemporary Science. Tonight we have Mick Follows from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Dr. Follows received his PhD in Atmospheric Sciences from the University of East Anglia in the UK in 1991. He then spent a year as a Royal Society postdoctoral fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Chemistry in Germany before joining the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He's now a senior research scientist at the MIT Program for Atmospheres, Oceans, and Climates. He's also the co-author of a new text, Ocean Dynamics and the Carbon Cycle. Dr. Follow's research is focused on the very complex interconnections between the physical, chemical, and biological processes that determine the distribution of elements in the ocean and the relationship between ocean ecosystems and their environment. This system requires expertise in multiple fields, mathematics, physics, chemistry, and biology, among other things. Understanding this global system is very important for science generally because it drives the planet. It's especially important in our time when there's so much climate and ecosystem change taking place. Tonight, Dr. Follows will explain one of the most important systems that sustains life on our planet, the global ocean carbon cycle. We'll find out what that is and why the ocean carbon cycle is both a fascinating and urgent area of study. We'll also learn how technology and computer model modeling are used to penetrate the complexities of the carbon global cycle. It's a very special pleasure to welcome Dr. Follows. Welcome, Thank Dr. You. Follows. Okay. Tonight we're going to talk about this very complex, convergent kind of field. And so I'd like to ask, just for starters, what is biogeochemistry? It's a kind of a buzzword. I, d <laughs> I don't know when it quite was coined, but um, as you say, um, we're working in a field of science where we're thinking about organization of elemental cycles in the ocean and that includes um, geophysical processes, maybe geological processes, geophysical processes being uh, transport by ocean currents for example, biological processes, the formation of new organic material mm -hmm. from inorganic components um, and ecological processes related to that and of course chemical processes, the transformations of uh, carbon and uh, uh, carbonates and other compounds in the in the ocean or in, in other environments and so biogeochemistry is a kind of convenient way to say it's this com complex system that involves physical, chemical and biological earth sciences, I guess you could Right, because yeah. I guess it's just one huge system, yeah. so I, we hear now system sciences yeah. too, and this, yes. is, this, is, this is one of them. So um, we're, we have this gigantic sort of field, mm -hmm. and then we hear a lot about the carbon cycle, yes. but I don't think that as a non-specialist that we understand it all that well. There are lots of cycles, but mm -hmm. can can you tell us what the carbon cycle is and then why it's so important? Okay. So carbon's a very abundant element on the planet and it's in all the different reservoirs. You could think of each uh, reservoir, the the, uh, the rocks, the geological mm. reservoir, there are, there's carbon trapped uh, or uh, tied up in uh, rocks. Uh, there's carbon tied up in trees and in litter in soils, so there's a what we call a terrestrial reservoir of carbon. There's carbon in both inorganic and organic forms in the ocean, but there's a lot of dissolved carbonate in the ocean, so a lot of 
uh, a huge amount of carbon in the ocean uh, relative to what's in the atmosphere. And finally, there's carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which we care about a lot because it's a, a greenhouse gas. It has an impact on climate, and it in turn is impacted on by climate. And, and so we can think of those reservoirs uh, uh, being all connected. And so I think the carbon cycle, uh, the global carbon cycle is really the partitioning of carbon, the element carbon between those four major reservoirs um, uh, and the fluxes between them. So um, depending on the temperature and other conditions of the ocean, carbon may dissolve, carbon dioxide may dissolve in the ocean. So there's a flux of carbon from the atmosphere mm -hmm. into the ocean and so on and so forth. And so the balance between all those different fluxes between the reservoirs and the partition of, of carbon between them is, uh, is what I would think of as the global carbon cycle. And so there's a land version and there's an ocean version, which you, I guess they sort of all go together. Right. But you concentrate on the ocean. Why is the ocean so important? So there's about 50, uh, 50 or 60 times more carbon t dissolved in the ocean mm. than is present in the atmosphere as CO2. There's actually a lot more than that in the rocks, but the carbon in the rocks is kind of tied up on long time scales. It takes hundreds of thousands or millions of years for the atmosphere and the rocks to kind of interact in a way that will dramatically change the atmosphere, for example. But the ocean and atmosphere communicate uh, rather quickly. So you could think of uh, uh, the ocean as a, the ocean carbon reservoir as a bath full of water, mm -hmm. and the atmosphere is a little cup next to it, and it's got much less ability to hold water. And so a little spill over the edge of the bath will hardly change what's in the bath, but it will fill the cup very mm -hmm. quickly. And so th we think that the ocean can affect the atmosphere rather quickly because they communicate well, but it's a huge reservoir, so a little change in the ocean can make a big change in the atmosphere. And so we think this has happened in the past in glacial mm -hmm, periods. Mm -hmm. uh, carbon has perhaps been taken out of the atmosphere and sequestered in the oceans, and uh, could be the other, ca other way in different climates. And so um, there's a lot of focus on how the ocean carbon cycle is working, how is it changing, because it changes in it might affect the atmosphere quite, sig quite quickly and significantly. Um, if we're thinking about the emission, the anthropogenic, the yes. man-made, yeah. uh, man, uh, man-made yeah. emissions or fossil fuel burning, putting CO2 into the atmosphere, um, that builds up a pressure of CO2 in the atmosphere that will drive, uh, ultimately drive carbon dioxide across the surface in into the mm -hmm. ocean, so it will dissolve in the ocean. Um, that has. Uh, that does impact the chemistry of the oceans, and so um, the ability of the ocean to keep taking up carbon dioxide will change as it's already the accumulating dissolved CO2. Um, uh, and uh, it will also potentially impact organisms in the ocean. One important part of the uh, ocean carbon cycle that we'll talk about uh, later, I think, is what we call the biological pump of mm -hmm. carbon and so in the surface ocean where there's plenty of light if there if nutrient rich waters get to the surface ocean then we can have photosynthesis so dissolved carbon dioxide can be taken up by organisms mm -hmm. turned into organic material and the, by phytoplankton tiny plants those plants get eaten by other organisms that eventually die or poop and detritus organic detritus sinks into back into the deeper ocean mm -hmm. And that leads to a net transfer of carbon from the surface ocean down into the deep ocean. Uh, it reduces the pressure of carbon in the surface ocean and allows more carbon from the atmosphere to be driven into the ocean. So this so-called biological pump, part of the ocean carbon cycle, uh, moves carbon basically down from the atmosphere into the deep ocean, reducing atmospheric CO2, mm -hmm. which is kind of we kind of like that nowadays because mm -hmm. we always mm -hmm. worried this mm -hmm. might be too much. And so if the ocean becomes more acidic because of the uh, dissolving of 
fossil fuel CO2, it's possible that that might uh, alter the kinds of organisms and the efficiency of growth of organisms and therefore the efficiency of this biological storage. And so there's a possibility that increased atmospheric CO2 will acidify the ocean. We know it will acidify the ocean and that acidification could potentially affect the ability of the ocean to store CO2 mm -hmm. and so it could have a, some kind of feedback. I think it's still an open question about the nature of that feedback. That's something we're trying to understand right now. So that's what you spend a lot of time on, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. you know, at, the, yeah. at this time then. Yeah. Well, then, um, while we're on that, is there, um, in your view, is there a, a, a substantial factor for the what the what we are putting into the atmosphere that is causing this is that's legitimate to be worried about that now or? There, there's sort of multiple levels to that question there's a big question I, you probably talked about it before I'm sure about how co2 is impacting the climate um, and may warm the oceans and so, so forth um, that's one particular issue. Another one that's very um, sort of current is that um, one thing is certain, the more CO2 that's in the atmosphere, the more dissolves in the ocean and the more acidic the uh -huh. oceans become. And that's something that we know um, is happening and it's happening quite rapidly. Now it has happened in the past, there have been periods in Earth history, uh -huh. you know, millions of years ago maybe, but when the oceans uh, may have been as acidic as they're heading towards now, but typically that took a long time yes, okay. to reach that state. And we're, we're making this change happen in decades mm -hmm. rather than thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of years. And so we're kind of in unexplored territory right. about what, how significantly uh, that, that will affect the system. Uh, we know that given a long time scales, ocean organisms may simply evolve and adapt to new conditions, but right. on what time scale does that happen? So there are some interesting questions that exactly. tie in evolution, exactly. uh, you know, all to the ocean chemistry and things. Because um, it's unprecedented. Mm, but the, it, it, the, it's really the, the time, the time yeah. scale of this change is, is, right. is what's so different, I think than right. previous, uh, than, than the Earth right. has seen. We just want to get mm. that clarified, that there are these cycles in the past and there are mm. these other factors, the mm. tilting of the Earth and the yeah. all, all of these kinds of things, yeah. but uh, th th that, in, as you mentioned in the book, it's, it's very well established that it's beyond just these cycles. You need to talk about these other yeah. uh, kinds of factors, the mm. human factor in this now. Mm. Can I switch to plankton? Yes. Can you, okay, because I don't know that it's intuitive for most mm -hmm. of us that um, that with, when we talk about this carbon cycle, that these little creatures that the whales love to eat, yes. <laughs> right? Yes. Those that these creatures are so vitally important for ecosystems generally. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us what these characters are? Mm -hmm. And I know you have some pictures of mm -hmm. them for us later and everything, but what what are they? Why are they important? So they the plants of the ocean, if you like, they're like the grass of the ocean, uh, mm -hmm. except they're tiny unicellular um, or, uh, organisms. They range in size from a micron, a thousandth of a millimeter in, in, in diameter, to, you know, approaching a millimeter in diameter. They sometimes live in colonies, mm -hmm. and so they might uh, 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 be be somewhat larger than that. The, the phytoplankton I'm talking about. Yes. They uh, they are uh, uh, phototrophs, which means that they uh, live by harvesting uh, energy from light. Mm -hmm. So they have chlorophyll, just in the same way as the terrestrial plants do. Uh, they harvest energy from light and use that energy to convert inorganic carbon, dissolve CO2 and other nutrient elements into organic molecules mm -hmm. to essentially to reproduce themselves. They just want to make a copy of themselves, right? Um, so as we talked about briefly earlier, um, all of this happens in the surface ocean. It's light. You, if, you're, if you uh, depend on light for your energy source, then you can only live in the top few meters, maybe mm -hmm. 100 meters of the ocean. 
Um, uh, and in that region, they're converting inorganic carbon, CO2, into organic molecules, which uh, help them reproduce. Um, when they reproduce, they're a food source for larger organisms, ultimately for fish. And those organisms are food for us, uh, whales, whatever, you know. And, um, and they have this role in the carbon cycle of the ocean because that uh, primary production, we call it, ultimately leads to the sinking organic material which uh, lowers atmospheric CO2. Okay, so we had better appreciate these little guys. Oh yeah, they're very <laughs> cool. Um, <laughs> okay. they, they, uh, if we didn't have them growing in the ocean, the atmospheric CO2 would probably be at least twice what it is now already, um, just in terms of a direct effect. They certainly contribute to the maintenance of oxygen in the atmosphere. Yeah. And so uh, so that's a fairly yeah. important they, uh, they, 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 They're very small and they live for a very short time yeah. as individuals, but they're very important on a global scale. Right, and you can mm. see them as you're going to yes, show us yes. later from a distance. Yes. Well, you can't see individuals, but the, they really show up and that's it's right. really significant for the, mm. for the carbon cycle and for the health of the planet in general, uh, right, apparently. Yes. Okay, now I'd just like to also clarify something about the models that yes. you all work with and to give people a sense of how you sort of figure things out. Can you tell us about how you do these models a little bit? And mm. Well, I'll talk about modeling, a li I'll try and I illustrate understand. that in yeah. with uh, some uh, slides later, but I guess I should clarify, you know, if we're trying to study the plankton in the ocean, how they relate to their environment, there are many ways to go about that and many people are um, uh, going out to sea and making measurements of their distributions yeah. at, at sea and what they're right. looking at what they're doing at sea. Others are bringing them back to the lab and asking, um, you know, under what conditions do they grow best. Mm -hmm. um, my group, we tend to work at the kind of theoretical end of things, and so we're trying to take those kinds of information and use mathematical models or computer simulations to A, try and uh, mimic what's going on in nature, but in a kind of code that we can interpret, and then use those models to understand um, how the system works. And so you can end up with a rather complex system mm -hmm. and sometimes by writing it down in a clean mathematical form you can kind of turn it into something that's a little bit easier to get your head around if you kind of understand that language and uh, by using computer simulations we can try and think about understanding how the system might change uh, have changed in the past or in the future in much the same way that a weather forecast works they mm -hmm. use computer simulations of the atmosphere, and I'll try and illustrate that. Yes, I, uh, mm. I wanted to mm. uh, get, since we have high school students sure. in, in our audience, that mm. uh, this modeling is really essential today in many fields, but certainly in this one, and that it is used a lot for predicting, but Dr. Follows has written on how to develop really good models because you could have models that are not so effective out there but you've put a lot of effort into um, thinking of really good models and I realize it's a challenge to work these we things We probably out. all think we have right, the best of models, course. right? Don't all right. But, uh, <laughs> but, but we, don't you know, be modest. No, 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 but, <laughs> it's quite all right, yes. But, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's fun to it's fun to try and do things a different way. Sometimes. Exactly, yeah, but yeah. Uh, uh, it just seems mm. as though you hear models, models, models mm. in all fields today, yeah, it's and very, it's yeah. become a really important mm. thing. Okay, um, I'd like to talk about your book just okay. very briefly, and sure. then the Darwin Project just briefly to, and okay. then we'll talk about gorgeous uh, uh, animations and things that you have for us. Uh, you and your colleague in England have written this wonderful book and uh, there's something in particular I'd like to be sure that we say about it. Would you like to tell us about the first two chapters? That right, yeah, so my friend Rick and I uh, decided that we'd accumulated various bits of understanding and we'd like to put them down in a book. We thought that our experience might be useful. Um, but we also thought it'd be a really a shame if we only spoke to our peers and mm -hmm. that we'd like our families and our friends to be able to at least read the first 
few pages of the book and get something about what we work on out of that. And so the first two chapters are written first as a motivation. Why are, why are the oceans important in the climate system? Why do we care about these biological and chemical mm -hmm. aspects of the ocean? And then a second chapter is kind of an overview, mm -hmm. an executive summary of the book, I guess written without any mathematics, hopefully in uh, plain language. And so th the aim was to try and have the first two chapters be useful for a much wider audience than the, the rest of the book, which gets rather technical, um, which is more aimed at our graduate mm -hmm, students, mm -hmm, for example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I'd like to say that it, uh, it's a very, it's a wonderful book. I've looked at the whole Thank thing, you, you know, and, uh, but you. I was very impressed that the authors would take the trouble, and it's a lot of trouble, to write for an, uh, uh, non experts or people mm. who are not planning to necessarily go into this field. Mm. And uh, it just should be on library shelves. So I was going to ask the public library to please order this book because it's indispensable in a lot of ways to get, get your head around something, a complex subject. It's very well done. So I just wanted to say that. Well, and thank you. Uh, it was thank a, you very a much. very nice book. And then our final question here before mm. we go on is about the Darwin mm -hmm. Project. So uh, this is not the rediscovery of evolution <laughs> or anything like that. But you have to work in teams in fields mm. like this. So could you tell us about that briefly? And then we'll use that to go to your slide. Right. I think, as you said, um, it's a complex subject and we all come from different disciplinary backgrounds and we have to specialize somewhat. But at the same time, in a topic like this, we need to overarch those uh, in disciplinary boundaries. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, to some extent, we can try and re-educate ourselves a little bit. But I think the m important thing is to be able to develop a lines of communication with the experts in the other pieces of the problem. Mm -hmm. and what so kind of experts that, uh, who, what kinds of experts are in the involved? So f in the Darwin Project, for example, it, this was a case where people like myself who had thought about the physics and chemistry of the ocean quite a lot and were interested in how that inter related to the biology, mm -hmm. but were not biologists, wanted to bring our area of expertise towards more ecological problems. Um, and to do that, we had uh, to collaborate with people from e ecology and biology. And they were interested at the same time to move towards uh, blending their expertise yeah. and ours. And so uh, that the Darwin Project was a project centered around using models and theory to try and understand how plankton communities are organized in the ocean, how the, the, the uh, rates of growth of plankton populations and the organization of different species of plankton in different environments worked by bringing together those di people from those different disciplines. And so we found a group of people who uh, were like-minded in that way and had found ways to communicate with each other. Our biologist colleagues are very patient with us uh, <laughs> and as corrected I'm sure us you many are times too, yeah. as we abuse their uh, <laughs> technical terms uh, frequently. I see. And so it's uh, so it's a project um, that's focused on using models and theory to understand the ecology and carbon cycle of the oceans. I see. Uh, bringing together these different people. Is it just MIT people or is it uh, uh, beyond the MIT? Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's really an MIT based project but we have lots of connections you know always you find people around the world who you enjoy communicating with or have bring something different that you'd like to pull in so we have nice collaborations with I see uh, some colleagues around the world. Right. Well, before you go on to your mm. to the slides, I'll just say that there's a link to the Darwin Project. It's quite something to to see this. There's a link on our page uh, for Dr. Follows, and you can uh, t have a look at the Darwin Project and some of these other uh, things that are going on. And now let me turn this over to you so that you can 
trot through these uh, through the the wonderful slides that you're going to talk to us about. Well, thank you. I thought what I would do is try and give a flavor of uh, what does uh, what does this mean? What what are models? What in what are ocean models? And how do we build them? How do we use them? And a little bit of history of that. Um, and I and I tried to put a few animations and slides together to illustrate that. I, ho I hope this is, uh, clears the air a bit. It always seems a little bit mysterious, I think, when you're not involved in it. Um, and so we talked about the ocean carbon cycle uh, and plankton. So this uh, mm -hmm. first image just shows a couple of things. On, on the, the left-hand side uh, are some images of individual phytoplankton cells, and so uh, the scale bar at the top is 20 microns, so one micron is a, a, a thousandth of a millimeter. So you can see, first of all, these tiny organisms. There's a, a diversity of uh, species or what we call functional groups. So there are many, many thousands of species which all <coughs> look or behave differently in the ocean. One thing they all have in common is that they all uh, use chlorophyll and other pigments to harvest light and perform photosynthesis. And you can see this, the large cell in the lower left is a diatom and that beautiful sort of honeycomb structure is made out of silicon, uh, mineral mm. silicon. Uh, and the little green blobs are chloroplasts, that's where its pigments, its chlorophyll are, where it harvests light. The map uh, on the uh, 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 top right is an image from space that's been manipulated a little bit. Just as you can see a forest of trees in the distance, you can't see the individual trees or leaves, but you can see green and you know there's a forest there. So too, when we look at the ocean from space, the greenness of the water tells us how much plankton is there, how much phytoplankton is present, how much chlorophyll. And that this is an image from a, a NASA satellite uh, that uh, uh, has been, uh, the, the colors have been tweaked, it's not really that bright, but where it's green or yellow uh, 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 um, or even orange is where the chlorophyll concentration in the surface of the ocean is very uh, high. And so you can see some features like the, the, the higher latitude oceans, the subpolar oceans are very rich in chlorophyll, there's a great supply of nutrients from below there, uh, whereas the subtropics uh, have very little chlorophyll in the mm -hmm. in the surface, and that's because the supply of nutrients is very uh, weak there. We can uh, see an animation of that. So mm -hmm. NASA's had these satellites flying for about uh, since the late 80s, and we now have beautiful uh, animations of uh, these uh, images of the distribution of chlorophyll in the surface ocean from space, and so we're just stepping through uh, several years' worth of these data. It's patchy, you can only see the ocean when it's not cloudy, so we, they're often when you see black there, it's just we couldn't get enough data. But you can see again these uh, regional patterns with uh, uh, intense chlorophyll concentrations in the subpolar regions and low chlorophyll concentrations in the in the sub subtropics. And you can see that the higher latitudes are very uh, seasonal. There are strong spring blooms in the North Atlantic. It's just blooming now. You can see intense oranges and reds uh, as, the, as the spring, the, the ocean warms up um, and uh, there's plenty of nutrients there and the plankton are suddenly happy and <laughs> uh, bloom, start reproducing like crazy. And then they're eaten by bigger organisms. And so to sort of switch to modeling, so this is a beautiful data set and a view of the oceans nowadays that relies on very modern technology. Uh, oh, uh, so back in the uh, 1940s, uh, people knew about uh, these, uh, just make sure this is, this is playing. Back in the 1940s, people knew about these spring blooms in the North Atlantic, for example, but not the, they didn't have these... Uh, uh, beautiful satellite technologies, but they were going out to sea in boats and taking samples and making direct measurements. And there's a very famous time series of measurements made at George's Bank, which is just off the coast of Massachusetts. I think you probably recognize uh, Cape Cod there. And that kind of uh, 
uh, orange and, and red spot just off the coast of Massachusetts is George's Bank. It's a bump in the seafloor that brings nutrients to the surface and fuels the growth of, of phytoplankton. And we know that that supports populations up to whales. In the 1940s, uh, a man called Gordon Riley, who was at Yale at the time, and his colleagues at Woods Hole uh, were aware of this uh, spring bloom in that system, and they uh, took several cruises over the course of a few years in different seasons and measured the, uh, the chlorophyll, the abundance of phytoplankton, and the temperature, and all the attendant environmental data in that region. And so their view of the phytoplankton abundance at George's Bank was from a single point in space, and each blue dot on this uh, graph uh, represents the measurement of the abundance of phytoplankton uh, at, at a different time in the year. So the, the x-axis is, is, uh, is, is month here. And what you can see is there's a low background uh, concentration of chlorophyll or phytoplankton, and then a big peak in the spring when this spring bloom happens. And Gordon Riley was a, a pioneer in uh, modeling plankton populations. So we, we still today use uh, ideas that Gordon Riley uh, uh, first uh, really brought to the table. And he was looking at how his physical oceanography colleagues were thinking about temperature changes and other physical changes and using mathematical models to mm -hmm. uh, try and predict them or interpret them. And he decided to do the same thing. And so just a little tiny bit of mathematics, it doesn't matter if you're comfortable with the mathematics, it's a differential equation. But he wrote down an equation and he said, the rate of change in the abundance of phytoplankton, that left-hand side, dB over dt, that rate of change is given by the balance between the growth of the population, the division of the cells, uh, and the losses due to respiration, which uses up their uh, body mass in, in just uh, providing bodily functions, and also grazing, predation by other organisms. And he just said we can write down a simple equation like this, and if we know how growth and loss terms depend upon the environment that the organisms are in, we can solve this equation uh, as a function of time. And, and predict what the system will look like. So it's just a very simple balance. If you know that there's more reproduction going on than, than predation, then the whole population is growing. Mm. If it's the opposite, then the population is dying. So it's really interesting. There were no computers then. So Gordon Riley sat down with a pencil and paper. And it took him a week to calculate the, a year's worth of solution, right? So it's no trivial task, and men, most of us wouldn't have the patience to do that now. And he was able to come up with this, uh, the solid line, which is theoretical prediction, which if you're involved in this kind of thing, I think you would know that uh -huh. that's a pretty good uh -huh. uh, model. That's uh -huh. a nice uh -huh. simulation. And he didn't get the chance to tweak it a lot because it was very labor intensive. And so he kind of showed us the way to uh, use mathematical models to predict how phytoplankton populations might change. And the models we use today are, are a lot more elaborate oh, and complex and demanding, but they, the, the fundamental philosophy of them and the fundamental way we write them down is pretty much the same as Gordon Riley. And so I want to think about how in the last, so over the last 70 years or so, one major thing that's happened, we ha now have much more elaborate descriptions of the ocean and so instead of modeling the plankton populations, trying to simulate what's happening to the plankton just at one point in space, we can try and do it over the whole globe. And to do that, we divide the globe up into tiny chunks, maybe a few kilometers across or maybe hundreds of kilometers across. And so this uh, image shows us a virtual bit of the North Atlantic. That's virtual Cape Cod from our computer model. There's the you know, province mm -hmm, town mm -hmm, sticking mm -hmm. out on the end there. And each little square is a chunk of the ocean. And we've assigned the dot in the middle. We assign a set of equations like those that Gordon Riley wrote down to calculate what's happening mm -hmm. at that place in the ocean. But we can do it all simultaneously. So it took him a week to calculate the plankton changes over a year at one point on this graph. Now we can use a computer to
calculate it for many thousands of points over the whole ocean simultaneously in a second or two um, and, and then project it forward for centuries if we want. Mm -hmm. So w we're not doing anything more mentally sophisticated but we have a lot of brute force power to mm -hmm. bring to the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I'll just animate this. This is actually showing the simulation. It's a model of sea surface temperature, the temperature of the surface ocean. So we can do a similar exercise for temperature, for nutrients, for uh, momentum and currents. And so as we step back, mm -hmm. we, the grid is kind of blending in and we can see we can make that grid span the whole Earth. And this is a simulation of the temperature of the oceans. Uh, and in a global sense. And so this is kind of like the ocean equivalent of a weather forecast model. When you look at a prediction of tomorrow's temperature in the atmosphere around us, they're using exactly this kind of technology, but it's employed in the atmosphere. And so you can think about these ocean models as the analogs of the uh, tools that weather forecasters are trying to use to tell what the weather's going to be like next week. Um, as well as temperature, those models will predict uh, the, or tell us something about the speed of the currents in the ocean. And so I'm not sure if you can see this very well, but the white areas are where the speeds are fastest. And you can see a currents like the Gulf Stream on the east coast of the US mm -hmm. moving swiftly northwards uh, and all sorts of interesting and rich features. And so again, it's like a weather forecast model that's telling you about the winds in the atmosphere. This is telling us about the currents in the ocean, and how that's moving properties in the ocean, like plankton, like carbon, around in the ocean. So we can simulate that. It's a bit like a big video game sim world, right? It's kind of, uh, uh, if you want to look at it in, that, in those terms. So we can add plankton into that model, and this is what my group done. So the physical models I've been showing you were done, made by our colleagues at MIT, and my group adds uh, phytoplankton into that system. And so basically we're solving a set of equations like Riley's equations at all of these thousands of grid points around the globe, uh, and we're telling those virtual plankton about their environment because from the physical model, from the ocean model. And so this is our simulation of the uh, chlorophyll from space that we saw earlier. And we can start to use these models as ways to interpret what's going on uh, in, the, uh, in the observed world. And so just to, for a comparison on the top now, you can see the uh, animated observations from space. And on the bottom is our prediction from a, a simulation. So it's a bit like comparing the actual weather that happened uh, yesterday with the prediction from the weather forecast model. And so again, as you well know from the weather forecast, it, we don't get it right all the time in every place. And so we can start to make quantitative comparisons, mm -hmm. careful comparisons. And where the model matches the observations quite well, we can then interrogate the model system we can ask any question of it because we've generated all those numbers. We know all the uh, values of the fluxes and the concentrations mm -hmm. of everything. We can start to use simpler theories to uh, boil it down to its essence. So this is one use of models is to try and first simulate and then interpret complex systems where there's a combination of all these different influences. One of the things that we've been doing in the Darwin project uh, particularly is to come back to this idea that that chlorophyll signature that you see from space, those uh, images of the abundance of plankton, actually reflect a di very diverse community. And there are different kinds of plankton living in different regions or dominating in different regions, just in the same way as you have uh, palm trees in the tropics, uh, on land, but uh, maybe pine trees as you move <laughs> into high latitudes where it's cooler or more seasonal. So too in the oceans there are different uh, types of plankton living in different regimes. And our colleagues are out uh, finding ways to observe those patterns. Uh, people are trying to interpret those patterns from space now again. We're trying to get more information mm -hmm. from satellites. And we can introduce that concept into our ocean model and so now here, 
The colours represent the abundance not of the total phytoplankton community, but of different species within that uh, community or different groups of species. And so again, there's this analogy with palm trees in the tropics. We have mm. these a green coloured population that like to live in the nutrient starved tropics or are well adapted to that, whereas the red colour guys are more adapted to very turbulent conditions, seasonal conditions, places where there are intermittently very high nutrient concentrations. And so our current work is very much focused on understanding why different phytoplankton live in different places, mm -hmm. how they relate to their environment, and what will happen if that environment shifts. Say the globe, uh, say the, the planet warms, uh, we think it's likely that the subtropical regions will expand in extent. So maybe the green organisms will uh, expand their domain. They'll become more uh, dominant in a larger region of the, the global environment. And so these are the kind of questions we can explore mm -hmm. in this model world. We can do all sorts of experiments like that and ask how does this system reorganize if it changes. And, and also, I guess, play with some of the factors that are, are uh, that you're trying to figure out how they change the That's right. balance of the whole system. That's right, and it's a complex system. So a change to one thing in the system, it's it's not always immediately obvious mm -hmm. what that will do to the rest of the system. And sometimes our intuition isn't right either. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a sort of alternative way to frame that a bit more formally and explore those kind of questions. Right. That's and really so, interesting yeah. that it can do that, yeah. So that's kind of what I wanted to say about uh, our, oh our efforts and a, yes. a little bit of potted history of modeling the oceans. Uh, yeah. This is my favorite movie. Uh, Oliver, our uh, visual guy in the group, loves to make these, so I thought this I'd just show just this. This is just really beautiful. Yeah. I hope people yeah. were able also to see the, there's a little like a calendar. It goes, the, you know, the months mm. down on the bottom and stuff. Mm. I hope it showed up all right mm. and stuff. But in any case, that was wonderful. And uh, Dr. Follows, thank you very much. And then uh, we'll, we'll shift to let people ask questions here too, if you would like to. And so thank you, first of all. Thank, thank you. you very much. And we'll open it for questions. We couldn't ask, we couldn't cover everything. So we hope that if you have some questions, hang around. They cover on the book. Okay. It must mean something. Yes. Uh, it's hard to, it looks like gases that are mixing. Yes. Uh, that's um, actually, it's a, a still picture from one of these animations. It, it's the, if I could just reach it across the, <laughs> this is the, the, the US, the east coast of the US, yeah. um, and uh, the South America. And uh, the colors, the, the, the white colors indicate the speed of the current. So this is the current in our simulation. So this is the Gulf Stream wending its way up the, uh, beside the east coast. You can see these eddies shed off. There sometimes are these big standing eddies in the, in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. Uh, the green colors here indicate the simulation of the chlorophyll. And so you are, you're, you're right, it's kind of, it's not gases, but it's liquid, but you're seeing the swirling interactions of, the, of this fluid environment. And I think one thing we see nicely in the model is just how dynamic it is and how rich <laughs> it is on all scales with these eddies and things. And um, it's really uh, kind of nice as a bit of abstract kind of pattern as well. You yeah. can have a look at the book too. It's full of fantastic graphics and stuff. Um, I think we'll have to mm -hmm. s stop, but you can uh, hang around, ask questions, or if the students have to go or something. But if you'd like to hang around, ask questions, this it will be fine. Mm -hmm. But they're going to cut us off because we have a time uh, thing. So I, I do apologize for that. But uh, in any case, you're free to talk with him. And I will stop here so that uh, because they're going to cut us off anyway, so. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. But please uh, hang around and ask questions. By if you talk to him, if you would like to, by all means. Thank you so much. Thank that you. was very thank interesting. You.
I, um, I was an undergraduate in physics and I went into atmospheric sciences after that um, and that led me to a, a postdoc at MIT um, where I was working on atmospheric problems but mostly surrounded by oceanographers and I got working with them and there are lots of parallels so it wasn't it's not a hard transition to make there and then over the course of a decade or so <laughs> I got most interest more and more interested in the biological aspects of oceanography um, and so I kind of slid gently from physics into more biological oceanography um, and I was able to follow my nose and my interests really. Um, I just found myself fascinated by a particular aspect of the problem so I was quite happy to go and read a very basic text on some aspects of biology and, and try and learn things along the way and so I guess you could say it was difficult you know I had to dive into something I hadn't thought about very much over the years but on the other hand that was the fun piece of it felt like I was still learning something new. I think certainly as an undergraduate it's great to, to, to dive into a discipline and the one that excites you most at the time and follow that, you know, do what makes you excited, what makes you interested and just be prepared for the fact that might change over the years. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you can change too if you want. Um, you can catch up. But, uh, I think it's perhaps not wise to try and be too diverse too soon. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, you could trip up. So it's good to find something you really like and follow that. So um, I, us I work with graduate students, as you said, they uh, come and join our program and um, they're interested in uh, oceans, climate, uh, system and uh, often coming from many different disciplinary backgrounds, physics, chemistry or biology, they're not necessarily completely sure of everything that's going on in oceanography, so they'll start the program by taking some classes and they get a broad view of the yeah. system and they're able to get a broad vision and then we'll work together on their research, uh, developing their research uh, skills and their research questions and then after a couple of years they define their own research project. I think you know when we're taking new graduate students uh, we don't care if they've had any oceanography or not they should be interested or climate science whatever they should be interested in that uh, if they've got a strong disciplinary background from chemistry, physics, biology, yeah. math um, or some combination of that, um, then then we think they'll have a, a solid foundation of thinking about problems and how to tackle them. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and then oftentimes people nowadays are very interested in cross-cutting questions, and so they have a chance to be introduced to those bits and pieces of the other elements of the problem at, at, as they begin graduate school. It's it's a good thing if you enjoy learning right because you you know you, you you'll be doing a lot of it right. um, it's good to be self motivated to to be allow yourself to be driven by your own questions and so i think uh, you know science is a bit like doing puzzles right and even if somebody else or thousands of people have discovered something before you when you first understand a new thing or some problem that seemed mysterious to you when you first kind of crack it you kind of it's a rush and you feel excited and, and you don't care if the whole rest of the world knew it um, and sometimes if you're very lucky nobody else did know it right okay. and so okay. and so I feel like there's that kind of rush that you get that kind of little tickle of pleasure that you would get when you realize you've just managed to crack the back of a hard puzzle or crossword or something okay. and, but sort of magnified yes. Um, uh, and that often happens in conjunction with colleagues you're talking about things at the blackboard and scribbling diagrams and equations down and solving it together uh, right. that's always fun those right. things are really great fun right. so for me I think you know it's kind of, there's a lot of different kind of groupings in science you could be in a very big project you know the 
the Collider project and in some yeah. sense is a very yeah. top-down large project that has to be controlled. Um, I think it's a little bit personality. Personally, I don't I would hate to be in charge of something big <laughs> like that. Yeah, I, I feel for me it's much more organic and I like to make connections with people who right. turns out for whatever reason we're like-minded and and so I like kind of small group science um, and I wouldn't be good at leading a big group science, I know that, but other people feel quite differently. So I guess it's, you know, like in every other walk of life, different people are going to function better and uh, but but you know if you're really solitary and you like working out equations on a bit of paper you can find that you can do that successfully too you know there's something for everybody yes, uh, if you want to be a big manager of a big project you can find a way to do that too yeah um, there's always things that feel like uh, a heavy weight at the time you know one of the things we do uh, as research scientists is uh, support ourselves and our groups by raising funds and you know it's good it keeps you sharp you have to justify the things you want to do but you know when it's late Sunday night and you're trying to finish a proposal that needs to be sent off to NSF tomorrow uh, and you wish you were doing something else you know <laughs> those moments can be a bit uh, a bit uh, kind of uh, less fun but you know they 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 come and go, uh, and and it's a it's pretty easy life really relative oh. to what you know many other people have to do. Oh.